well this brings us to this wonderful section achieving success in family and business and here are the basic rules number one is your happiness should be your chief aim in life your happiness should be your chief aim in life if it's not your chief aim whose is it going to be if you don't set your happiness as the most important organizing principle of your life nobody else ever will and don't ever think that you'll be unhappy and you'll make others happy because you can't give away something you don't have if you're not a happy person you can't make anybody else happy you can just make them varying degrees of miserable so get over this thing that you're a sacrificial lamb and your happiness is to be sacrificed on the altar of someone else's because you're not doing anybody a darn bit of good you're just going through the suffering that Boy, your parents right taught you right was here. part of you know being a part of your family and your religion the fact is that if you make your happiness your primary organizing principle you'll probably never make another mistake now the second rule is this is that 85 percent of your happiness comes from your relationships with other people so therefore it behooves you to do everything possible to be in relationships with people you enjoy and care about and to take the time to be good at relationships remember all the most successful and highest paid people are relationship experts they're relationship experts they're very good they have very high levels of social intelligence and it's not ever because they're fabulous talkers it's because they're wonderful questioners and listeners the nicest, warmest, most important people you know are the people who are just such a pleasure to be with. And because they ask you questions and they listen, you have this nice ebb and flow. Number three is uh, moderation in all things. Is what the ancient Greeks taught. Moderation in all things. You need balance between your family and your work to be happy. Now, balance between family and work is one of the critical issues of the modern age. People come up and ask me, what's the key to balance? I say, what's the key to health? Well, there's a thousand things. Good, a thousand things to balance. Balance is like going across a tightrope on a windy day. Do you ever get perfectly balanced and then you just stroll? You've got to constantly be balancing all the time, all the time. With every single influence and force and demand and pressure on your time, you have to constantly be balancing. And as long as you have conflicting demands and multiple conflicting demands, the balancing act never stops. So therefore, there is no simple answer, and there's no quick answer, and there's no answer that's valid, you know, an hour, and a half an hour after you get it, because the answers have changed. So number four, we know that a feeling of stress and, and dissatisfaction arises when your activities and goals are not congruent with your values. Are not congruent with your values. The interesting thing is that all problems in life can be resolved by a return to values. Almost invariably, when you're doing, living one life that is inconsistent with what you really believe to be right and true and good, it causes you stress. And you can tell, by the way, when your life is out of balance. If you're driving a car down the road and your front wheel is out of balance and you're driving down the road, what happens? It shudders, doesn't it? If you keep driving and keep driving and keep driving without getting it fixed, what will happen? It'll eventually shudder and it'll vibrate and snap right off. You ever driven along and seen a car in the ditch with the wheel right up under the wheel well? You ever seen that? See on a regular basis? The wheel was unbalanced for a period of time. When your life is out of balance, you also go through the same kind of emotional process, only it's expressed differently. It's expressed in irritation, anger, impatience, angry outbursts, poor sleep, insomnia, constipation, uh, headaches, a uh, feeling of being in a rat race and uh, under pressure. When your life is out of balance, you start to feel all these things because when you're perfectly balanced, you're in harmony, you're centered, you're a happy person. You feel relaxed and calm. Even if you're busy, you feel calm. You feel calm inside. So whenever you start to get snappy, irritable, short-tempered, it means your life is out of balance. And you have to pull it back into balance. Back into balance. So, start with your values. Start with your values. What is really important to you? Remember, if you're out of balance, there's something wrong with your values. What you're doing and what you believe are clashing. If one of your values is that you really love and care about the members of your family and you're working all the time and not spending any time there, stop and do an analysis. Wait a minute. Wait a minute here. What am I doing that is inconsistent with my values? And then, number six, describe 
and decide no, upon your ideal lifestyle. Remember, whenever you're having stress, it's because your real situation is inconsistent with your ideal. So stop and say, you know, if my life were ideal in every respect, what would it look like? And don't do what the low performer does. The low performer yes. always thinks of the reasons why it's not possible to get their life back into balance. The high performer always thinks, I want my life in balance, and then asks, how? So you say, okay, if my life were in balance, what would it look like? Vision. Vision, if my life were perfectly balanced, what would it look like? And that's your vision. And then you say, okay, how, how can I make that vision my reality? Number seven is to do more of one thing, you must do less of another. To do more of one thing, you must do less of another. So in order to get your life back into balance, what should you be doing more of? What should you be doing less of? That's the great question. And if you're not sure, go to your boss, go to your spouse, even go to your kids. What should you be doing more of? Do you see anything that I should be doing more of or less of from your point of view? And often they'll say, well, you know, if you just didn't do this all the time and spend so many hours doing that, you'd have far more time. And you never thought about that. We, in Peak Performance Woman, by the way, we talk about time compression, where you take a whole lot of tasks, like shopping tasks, and you do them all at once in one trip rather than spending as much as 500% of the time going on a little shopping trip here and a little shopping trip there, and a little errand here and a little errand there, Jets. what you do is you plan them, structure them, telephone ahead, and just go bing, 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 and do them all at once. Absolutely amazing. Remember, anything where you do everything at once is reduced by about 80% because of both the learning curve and the experience curve. So you have to bunch your tasks to get more time. Jacks. Number eight. Treat your time like money. Treat your time like money. How can you best invest it to achieve maximum satisfaction? And always ask yourself, is this the very best investment or use of my time? And if it's not, stop doing it and start doing what is. Remember, time is irreplaceable. Yes. You cannot save it. You can only spend it differently. Number nine is set peace of mind as your highest goal. Set peace of mind as your highest goal and organize your life around it. Right if you said peace of mind is your highest goal and you only do what gives you a sense of inner peace, you'll perform at the highest levels of performance and you'll be the happiest and most fulfilled person of all. You'll be more creative, you'll be more positive, you'll be more personable. And if you said peace of mind is your highest goal, hey. you'll never make another mistake. Men and women become great when they set peace of mind as their highest goal. Can you imagine Mother Teresa, who's already talking about being canonized if it doesn't get sidetracked by the politics in the church? Can you imagine her doing other than what gave her great peace of mind? She was, by all intents, a very happy person. From the time she began her work, and you read some of the accounts in the paper today, they always sang. They were always happy. They were doing, they weren't doing it because they felt like victims or they felt they were, had to punish themselves. They were doing it because it gave them joy. And that's the most amazing thing. They just loved what they were doing. It felt wonderful when they were doing it. Number 10, the key to balance is to do just two things, especially during the formative years of your family. And the two things are hey, work come on. and family. Do just two things. One of the big mistakes that we make is when we get married, and especially when we have children, we try to keep on doing all the things that we were doing, social mm, engagements, tennis, golf, uh, all those different things, and we don't realize that the answers have changed dramatically. When I first got married, I was taking flying lessons, I was running, jogging, playing racquetball, I was working with the Chamber of Commerce, giving talks and things like that, and then when I got married, Married took up more time, and then I had my first child. Let me tell you what the two stupidest things you can say. Actually, there's two dumb things and one dumb question. You know what they are? Question, the dumb thing number one, I said, I'm getting, we're getting married, but it's not going to affect our lifestyle. <laughs> number two is we're having a child, but it won't affect our life at all. <laughs> and the third, the dumbest question here. of all, is when you Get ask a woman who has one or more children, do you work? 
Yes, she does. 16, 17 hours a day, usually for 15 to 18 years, seven days a week, 365 days a year with no breaks, no pay, and nothing off. Anybody who ever suggests that women with children do you work, never, never, never say that, because boy, do they ever work, and thank God they do. Thank God for mothers. Thank God for mothers. Oh, we love you. We love you. I am, I am in awe of mothers. Oh. Anyway, number, number 11, work all the time you work. Work all the time you work. When you work, put more of yourself into the work. Work 100% of the time. Now remember the law of the excluded alternative, and please understand this. If you are socializing with your friends at work and not getting your job done, does the work go away? So it has to be done, doesn't it? And if the work goes away, here's a rule. Hard time drives out soft time. Just like something hard will push aside something soft, hard time is the work that you must do if you want to remain employed and pay your bills. Soft time is time with your family. If you don't do the work at work, the hard time, the work must be done so the sacrificial lambs will be your family. Time will have to come out of family time. Are you with me so far? When you are talking and idly socializing and chit-chatting with your coworkers and not getting your work done, you are taking that time like bread out of the mouths of your children. You're taking that time away from your family. So the question you always have to ask, is chit-chatting with my coworkers more important than the quality of my relationship with my spouse and my children? Because that's the choice you're making, and everything counts. And if you remember that, you realize, well, when I'm at work, I work. And you're a fine person, but I don't love you more than I love my kids. <laughs> I'm sorry. And if I keep talking to you, I'm not going to get the work done. I'm going to have to take it home. Here's the story of a little girl. Goes to her mother and says, Mommy, how come Daddy brings a briefcase full of work home every night, and he works and works and works, and never spends any time with the family? And she says, well, honey, you have to understand. Daddy's got too much work to do, and he can't get it done at work. So he has to bring it home and work. Oh, she said, well, why don't they put him in a slower class? <laughs> People who don't get their work done at work eventually get put in slower classes. Number 12 is when you're with your family, be there 100% of the time. When you're with your family, be there 100% of the time. Be there. Now, when are you with your family? When are you with another person, by the way? When are you with them? I'll tell you when you're with the members of your family is when you're in their face. When you're in their face, that's when you're with them. You're not with them when you're under the same roof. You're not with them when you're watching television at one end of the house and they're doing something else at the other end. You might as well rent a hotel room downtown and watch television if all you're gonna do is sit at home and watch television while your family drifts around you like you know, logs in a, in a logging pool. Remember, the only time you're there is when you're face to face, heart to heart, knee to knee. So if you're going to be there, be there. Be there in their face. That's very, very important. One of the rules that I set as a young man when I had my first child was this. If ever my kids wanted to talk and I was reading, I would put it down. I would never put aside reading material for my children because the reading material would, be all, would always be there. I had a friend, a young woman who, I just saw recently a very nice woman, very attractive, very intelligent, and yet she's never, she's always had problems in her relationships, married unsuccessfully a couple of times. And she remembers, she recalls, whenever she wanted to talk to her mother as a child, her mother would say, get away from me, I'm reading. Get away from me, I'm reading. Get away from me, I'm reading. Can't you see I'm reading? Go away and play. And she grew up with a profound sense of worthlessness, that this piece of paper, the books, the newspaper, was more important than she was. And now as an adult, she's probably 40, never recovered. She's still struggling, still struggling with those inner feelings of worthlessness. Get away from me, I'm trying to read. So it's very important, if a member of your family wants to talk to you, turn off the television, as hard as it may be. Close the magazine or newspaper, put it down, put it aside, make it clear that they're more important than they are. And make a habit of doing that. It really makes a difference. Be there 100% of the time. Number 13 is um, limit and restrict television, newspapers, and outside activities. Remember the law of the excluded alternative, which says doing one thing means not doing something else. So therefore, stop doing 
whatever it is so you can start doing more of that here's a basic rule is number fourteen spent unbroken chunks of time with the most important people in your life this chunks of time philosophy has profoundly changed the lives of many people who've been through this course and I'll tell you why is you need thirty sixty ninety minute chunks of time hey, Jax, Jax, with the members of your family in order to build and maintain on, Jax, strong bonds of communication because oh yeah, that's how long it takes for the bonds to form it's almost like a mold that takes time you cannot keep a relationship going with splatter gun shots of a couple of minutes right here, here and a couple of minutes there throughout the day it takes periods of time 30 to 60 90 minute chunks of time are critical because how do children spell love? They spell it T-I-M-E. How do spouses spell love? They spell it T-I-M-E. They spell it in face time. Now, I'll give you two or three simple rules that work. Number one is when you come home at night, do not watch the television. Do not walk in the house and turn on the television because it simply shuts down all communication in the house. If it's on, turn it off. We will not allow the television on in our family room or at the end of the day. The kids have television that we can go watch a television if they want, but in the middle of the family, we don't allow television. Why? It's because it takes away. So the first hour should be a rebonding hour with the person who's there. It should be rebonding. How did your day go? And men especially should ask the women in their lives how their day went and ask thoroughly and listen thoroughly before you contribute how your day went because her day was probably more interesting than yours, I'm sorry to say. Second of all, have dinner with your family as often as possible around the table. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, whatever you possibly can. Be clever about it. Be determined. Me insist. I have to sometimes drag my kids kicking and screaming to have dinner. Oh, why do we have to have dinner with the family? You get there. And, and then while you're at the table, two rules. Don't talk about business. Kids hate it when you talk about business. All they want to do is get away, because you might as well be in a different world. Second of all, no radio, no television, nothing on. Never have a television on when you're having meals with your family, because other than that, you might as well break up and go in separate rooms, because everybody just watches the television. So it's very important that you practice those. The first hour of the day, take time to talk to members of your family, no radio, no television, no newspaper, and have meals with your family as often as possible. Now, with regard to chunks of time, this is terribly important, is the very best chunks of time are walks. Going for regular walks with a member of your family, especially with your spouse in the evening, is a wonderful way to rebond, communicate, center, get lots of exercise, strengthen your whole body, digestion. It's just wonderful. My wife and I walk all the time. But second of all, whenever you go for a drive, remember a car is one of the most powerful communication tools in the world. If you get into the car and go for a drive with another person, don't ever listen to anything. Not even my stuff. And I'll tell you why, because if you create a vacuum within a moving automobile, it will fill with conversation. And sometimes you'll learn more about the other person in a few minutes of driving with them in a car than you may have learned in weeks of living with them at home. Okay, here's the last seven uh, self-motivators and then we're on our way. I appreciate you guys, you guys are really great. We've had a good day, haven't we? Yeah. Yes? <laughs> Thank you. And these are the last seven reminders and we're on our way and I want you to think about how you're going to apply them. Number one, get serious. Get serious, make a decision to go all the way to the top. Up to now you've thought about it, up to now it's passed your mind. Many of you made the decision and you decided to get serious and your lives have taken off. It's the most extraordinary thing. Your life is one, like in the shadow, going up the dark side of the hill until the moment you decide that, by gum, I'm going to be the best in what I do. I'm going to be in the Come top on, 10%. And suddenly you emerge into the sunshine and your life is forever after different. Wonderful, get serious. Don't fool around anymore. Number two is identify your limiting step to sales success. What's your limiting step? What's the one skill area that's holding you back? What's the skill? What's the quality? What's the attribute? Ask other people. Find out. What do you need to become good at? Sometimes you may be only one skill. 
if you became really, really good on the telephone, you could maybe double your prospecting effectiveness and double your sales. If you became very, very good in getting the order at the end from qualified prospects, you could Back. double your sales. If you became very, very good at managing your time, so you really, really manage your time well, you may be able to double your face time and double your income. Find out what's holding you back. What's holding you back? What is the critical limiting step that's determining your success today? Number three is get around the right people. Who are the right people? The right people are the people in this room. Get around winners. Get around positive people. Get around people with goals and plans and people who are going somewhere with their lives and have high aspirations. Get around and fly with eagles. As Zig says, you can't continue to scratch with the turkeys if you want to fly with the eagles. And get away from negative people. Get away from toxic people that complain and whine and moan all the time. Who needs them? Jeez, life is too short. Number four. Number four is take excellent care of your health. Take excellent care of your physical health. That means good diet, good exercise. Everybody knows they should eat better foods. Regular exercise, and especially lots of rest. That's very important. If you're going to work hard five days a week, go to bed early five days a week. Get a good night's sleep. Be fully rested. Tonight, be really rested. You don't have to watch The Letterman Show. It's brain dead anyway. I think it's played mostly into institutions and mental asylums. I mean, I mean, it's, I mean you just look at this useless gibberish and claptrap. Watch Jay Lee. Jay, 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 Jay's better. Number five, positive visualization. Positive visualization. See yourself as the very best in your field. Remember, all improvement in your life begins with an improvement in your mental pictures. See yourself. Visualize yourself continually. You are the best. Isn't that right? Yes. yes. So therefore, see yourself as the best. And number six, positive self-talk. Talk to yourself positively all the time. Control your inner dialogue. And what do you say to yourself? You say, I'm the best. Say it. Say, I'm the best. I can do it. I like myself. I love my work. Yes, that's how you talk to yourself. And the more you say it to yourself, someone, someone said, well, Pete's saying, well, what, do you, what if you say those things in, in yourself and you don't believe them? Isn't that lying to yourself? No, that's not lying to yourself. It's telling the truth in advance. Because it doesn't matter where you're coming from. All that matters is where you're going. Talk to yourself the way you want to be, not the way you just happen to be at this moment. Remember, you may have gotten to where you are today largely by accident, but where you're going in the future is purely by design. And number seven, positive action. Get going. Move fast. Develop a sense of urgency. A sense of urgency is the one thing that you can develop that will separate you from everyone else in your field. Develop a bias for action. When you get a good idea, do it now. Do it now. Do it now. Only 2% of people in our society have a bias for action. And if you're already in the top 10%, you can move yourself into the top 2% by resolving that whenever you have an idea or something, do it now. Do it now. Do it now. And the faster you move, the better you get. And the better you get, the more you like yourself. And the more you like yourself, the higher your self-esteem is. And the higher your self-esteem is, the greater your self-discipline, and the more you persist, and you ultimately become unstoppable. You're the best. You're the best. This concludes day one of Brian Tracy's Success Mastery Academy. Now, listen on for a special bonus section, Brian's Seven Steps to Mental Fitness. Hello, I'm Brian Tracy, and I want to talk to you today about one of the most important single aspects of success, of all kinds of success, and it's what you've heard of called a positive mental attitude. A positive mental attitude is a generally constructive response uh, to the stresses that face the average person every single day. A positive attitude is where you feel that you have the ability to control your world and to control your life. A positive attitude is a, like a chicken and egg thing. If you're successful, you're positive. If you're positive, you're successful. Which comes first? It doesn't really matter, but we know this, is that positive thinkers are men and women who accomplish an awful lot more than people who have negative mental attitudes. In fact, we've come to the conclusion that positive thinking is really mental health, and negative thinking is really 
mental illness. Now, if you look at this spectrum of people from the unhealthiest to the healthiest mentally, you'll find that at the very top, you have the happiest people with the highest self-esteem who are the most positive and outgoing. At the very bottom, you have the most negative and pessimistic people who often require drugs and hospitalization. Your job is to develop a positive mental attitude. Your job is to become thoroughly positive and constructive towards yourself and your possibilities and the world around you and the people in your life. And the way you do this is very much the same way you develop physical fitness. Now, if I were to say to you, if you go to a gym and you work out on a regular basis, an hour, hour and a half a day, and you do this every day for 30 days, and you match that with a proper diet, that you'll actually see a difference in yourself physically. Now, if I were to say that to you, you'd say, oh, of course, anybody knows that. If you worked out steadily for 30 days, you'd notice a difference. Well, it's the same thing with mental fitness. We know that you can't see the results of mental fitness the same way you can see physical fitness, but you can see the results of it. And mental fitness comes from following a specific exercise program. It comes from doing things in a certain way every single day. And it's much easier than going to a gym and sweating and working out. So what you need to do is you need to get onto a mental fitness program that enables you to become more and more strong, resilient, confident, positive, optimistic, and to develop a positive mental attitude. So I'm going to ask you to do this for me. I'm going to give you seven steps, seven things that you can do, seven things that have been proven to work. What I'm going to ask you to do is that you practice these seven steps for 21 days. The reason for this is it takes 21 days to develop a new habit pattern of any kind. If you work on a habit pattern and you practice it every day, you begin to develop new neural grooves in your brain that cause you to think and act more optimistically automatically. You get up in the morning feeling better. You are more positive toward the challenges you face during the day. You're more optimistic in the face of adversity. You start to become a more confident and optimistic person. And when you do, you'll find your whole life will open up around you like sunshine on a bright morning. Now, I've worked with psychologists for more than 25 years. I've studied psychology since I was a young person, and I've had teams of psychologists come to my courses. And what they've told me, and what I'm going to tell you, is that these are the most advanced techniques of behavioral modification that are taught in the very best universities today. But I'm going to teach them to you as very, very simple, powerful techniques that you can take and run with, use on yourself, and use with the people around you. There's seven basic steps to mental fitness. If you practice all of these steps together, what will happen to you is incredible. But here's the first rule, and this is the rule that runs through everything, and it is this. Remember that everything counts. This is the great rule of success. Everything helps or everything hurts. Everything counts. And your job is to remember that everything we talk about counts. It affects you one way or the other. And your job is to use every single one of these as often as you can. In 21 days, you won't even notice the difference. You'll be so astonished at yourself. Number one is positive self-talk. Positive self-talk has been getting very good press in the last little while. Positive self-talk means that you talk to yourself in a positive way. It means that you are optimistic in your conversation with yourself. What we have found is that 95% of your emotions, how you feel about yourself on a minute-to-minute -minute basis, are determined by the way you talk to yourself. Now, the average person has about 1,500 words of dialogue running through their brain every minute. It runs at an incredible speed. It's almost impossible. It's called stream of consciousness. It's like a river of consciousness. Your job is to deliberately interfere with that stream and make sure that your thoughts are on what you want and are off of the things that you don't want. We know also that there is a thing in, co in cognitive psychology called explanatory style. Explanatory style is, has to do with how you explain things to yourself. We know that successful people, positive people, are people who explain things to themselves in a positive way. They say, well, that's an interesting situation, or, oh, that'll work out OK, or don't worry about it. Everything is going to happen for a good reason, and so on. Positive people are those who constantly take what is happening, and whereas negative people interpret them differently, explain them differently, positive people turn them around and explain them well. W. Clement Stone, one of the richest men in the world, said that one of the keys to his success was to look at every adversity and immediately say, that's good, that's good, and then to find something in it that was good. Find something in it that was good. So the second part of positive self-talk is to control your inner dialogue, is to control what's happening inside you and to be aware that the average person, if they're not careful, will have a tendency to be negative. You'll have a tendency to think about the things you worry about. You'll have a tendency to be skeptical. You'll have a tendency to be cynical. It's absolutely amazing that positive people today, who are basically people with high levels of mental health, are under attack by the negative people. 
And here's the key to positive self-talk. It's one of the most important parts of modern psychology, and it's the use of affirmations. Now, affirmations are positive statements that you make to yourself about yourself and your world. Remember, you become what you think about. What you repeat to yourself over and over again is accepted by your subconscious mind as a command. And there are three P's to affirmations. There are three P's to self-talk. First of all, it must be personal. That means all really good self-talk that programs your subconscious begins with the word I. I can, I am, I like myself, I can do it, I feel happy, I feel healthy, I feel terrific. Now the second P is it must be in the present tense. In other words, you don't say, I will quit smoking, I will earn a good living, I will be happy. You say, I am happy, I am a non-smoker, I feel terrific, I like myself. You say it today as though it were in the now. We know that your subconscious mind does not take in information that is couched in a future tense. And the third is that it's positive. So instead of saying, I'm not going to smoke anymore, you say, I am a non-smoker. We find again that the subconscious mind sorts out and deletes any negatives. So if you say something like, I am a non-smoker, which some people say, the subconscious mind takes out not and just simply records, I am a smoker, I am a smoker, and so on. Affirmations are the key. With affirmations, your potential as a person is unlimited. The discovery of affirmations and the development of affirmations as a science has been one of the greatest breakthrough areas in human potential. If I could give you one secret of success, it would be this. It is to talk about the things you want and refuse to talk about the things you don't want. It's to talk continually in terms of what you want to happen. It's to interpret things continually in terms of the way you want them to be. It's to continually control your inner dialogue so you're always saying the things to yourself and then to others that are consistent with the person you want to be and the life that you want to have. Remember, 95% of your feelings are determined by the way you talk to yourself. It's absolutely essential that you talk to yourself the way that you want to be. Now, the second part of mental fitness, the second key is positive visualization. Positive visualization means that you control your mental pictures. We know from the various mental laws that we've discussed is that all improvement in your life begins with an improvement in your mental pictures. We know that because of the law of correspondence that your outer world tends to be a mirror on, of your Jack. inner world. This means that what you see on your outside, what you see in your relationships, your health, your work, your customers, and so on, tends to be a result of the pictures you have inside. We also know that your self-image controls your performance. Is the way you see yourself and think about yourself inside determines how you yes. act on a day-to-day -day basis. If you see yourself and think about yourself as an extraordinary person, if you see yourself as a success, if you see yourself as happy and positive and confident and in control, if you see yourself as a loving parent or spouse, you will act that way toward others. So therefore, all improvement in your life begins with an improvement in your mental pictures, with you consciously and deliberately selecting the pictures that you're going to allow your mind to dwell upon. And that word dwell is terribly important. When you dwell upon a picture, your subconscious mind, just as with affirmations, accepts the picture as a command and goes to work to bring that picture into your reality. It's the most phenomenal thing. Your subconscious mind controls your reticular activating system or your reticular cortex as well. Your reticular activating system is very interesting. It's a small part of your brain. It's like a, a switchboard in your brain that controls all incoming impulses. Uh, let me give you an example. If you've ever thought that you're going to buy a red sports car, you send a signal to your brain that red sports cars are now important to you. Your reticular activating system suddenly activates all of your senses so that wherever you go, you see red sports cars everywhere. Every time you turn around, you see them turning the corner, you see them parked, you see them in parking lots, you see them in newspapers and, and magazines, you see them everywhere. If you begin to tell your brain that you intend to be a great success in your field, that you are going to move to the top, that you're going to uh, be one of the most esteemed people in what you do, if you're going to make a lot of money, whatever it happens to be, this is, is accepted as a command. The reticular cortex switches on all these switches, and from then on, you begin to see all kinds of possibilities that help you move toward achieving that goal. Why is it that successful people move so rapidly toward achieving their goals? It's very simple. It's because they're thinking all the time, and as a result, 
of thinking about what they want, they see all kinds of opportunities around them to achieve that. The average person doesn't even see because the average person is so worried about how little money they have and how much their bills are, and all the problems are, and the more they think about those things, the more they get them. So, with regard to positive visualization, see yourself as you desire. Remember we said earlier, see yourself enjoying the success that you want. See yourself as you desire. And what will happen is your subconscious mind will say, well, this must be a command, this must be what you want. So it goes to work and it coordinates your words, actions, thoughts, activities, emotions, and so on, so that they're consistent with achieving and bringing that mental picture into your reality. If you interview successful people, it's a very interesting thing, if you interview successful people and you ask them on a regular basis, what do you think about? What are you thinking about now? You find that successful people are always thinking constructive, positive, creative thoughts that help them to be more successful. And if you interview negative people who aren't doing very much with their lives, you ask them what are they thinking about, they're always thinking about negative, uh, hurtful, uh, destructive, uh, angry, resentful, worried thoughts. And surprise, surprise, the more they think about them and worry about them, the more they draw them into their lives. Be careful. Your mind is very, very powerful. And finally, the third part of positive visualization is to feed your mind continually. Feed your mind continually. Feed your mind on a regular basis, the way you would feed your body with a special kind of food. Feed your mind with pictures consistent with what you want. Just before you go to bed at night, visualize and see your ideal situation the coming day. See yourself performing at your best. See yourself living your ideal lifestyle. When you feed that picture into your mind just before you go to sleep, what happens is your subconscious and your superconscious goes to work on it all night long. Very, very powerful technique. One of the most powerful of all for success. Now, the next technique, number three, is positive mental food. Just as we said, and we're talking about mental food in a way, but just as we said before uh, that you become what you think about, if I were to say to you, oh, there's a remarkable discovery. Did you know that you become what you eat? That your food determines your physical health? If I were to say that to you, you'd say, oh, give me a break, Brian. Everybody knows you become what you eat. And uh, the problem is we just don't eat the things that we should. Positive mental food is exactly the same. You, begin, you become what you think about most of the time. In other words, your whole life today, everything around you has been determined by what you think about most of the time. You've attracted this into your life. You've attracted your relationship. You've determined your income by what you think about most of the time. Now, if you think about positive, constructive, success-oriented, happy things, you start to have more of those in your life. If you think about uh, movies and television and sports and uh, wasting your time and socializing, well, you'll have a lot of those in your life, but you won't have anything else. Remember, whatever you think about most of the time crowds the other things out of your life. So, in becoming what you think about, what do you feed your mind on a regular basis? And this is not something that you are uh, casual about. You must be very, very deliberate and feed your mind a diet of mental protein, of highly nutritious words, pictures, quotes, magazines, television, audio tapes, books, newspapers, and so on. The average person, when they look, you look at what they read, the average person reads sensational, negativistic, violent, garbage. In fact, they tried to publish a newspaper on several occasions that only had good news in it, and the newspaper failed. Do you know why it failed? It's because the great majority of people wouldn't buy a newspaper that did not have dreadful stories of dreadful things happening to innocent people. Your job is to ask yourself when you look at a book, is this going to help you in some way? Let me ask you a question. What do you think would happen to you if you read a whole lot of horror books, or a whole lot of murder books, or a whole lot of violence books? What do you think would happen to you if you read these books all the time? Do you think it would affect your mind? Huh. You bet your bippy it would affect your mind. What do successful people read? They read books that are positive and constructive and success-oriented and uplifting and educational and motivational. If you read all the negative stories in newspapers day after day after day, you get the idea, by the way, that our whole society is falling apart. If you read negative stories in magazines, you get the same thing. It's interesting with regard to newspapers and the economy. One of the things we found is that newspapers always put the most negative spin on everything. Back in the 80s, they tracked news stories. In 1982, when the entire economy was in the ditch, interest rates were 21%. Unemployment was 11%. Companies were going bankrupt everywhere. Do you know what happened? The number of negative news stories on the economy were four to one. Four negative for one positive. 
1986, the economy was booming. It was the world was standing impressed by the beauty of the American economy. Jobs were being created everywhere, and the number of negative news stories on the economy moved up to seven to one. Seven negative for every one positive. Watch radio, television, audio tapes. The things that you feed into your mind have such an enormous impact on your mind. Make sure that what you're listening to, what you're watching, what you're hearing is consistent with what you want to accomplish. Now, the fourth part of mental programming, the fourth part is positive people. We know this, is that people account for about 85% of your happiness and unhappiness in life. And extensive studies at uh, Harvard came up with an expression called your reference group. Now, your reference group are the people that you think yourself to be like. It's when you're growing up, your first reference group is your family. Then it's your it's school, and then you grow up and you join clubs and associates, and sometimes you go to church or eventually you join a political party or you join a career. And each time, the people in that field are your reference group. You have to think about this question. What people do you most identify with? What people do you most consider yourself to be like, to be, to be one of? Uh, they're like me, I'm like them. What do we know about high-performing men and women? is that their reference group from a very early age are the most successful people in their field. They're the most admirable people. They're the most positive people. They're the kind of people that they admire and want to be like. What is your reference group? Who do you socialize with? Who do you go for lunch with? Who do you go out for dinner with? Who do you like to read about, talk about? Who is your reference group? Because it will determine your life and your success as much as anything else. And your reference group has got to be winners. Get around winners. Get around positive people. Get around people who are goal-oriented. Get around people who are going somewhere with their life. Get around people who talk, as they, they say in the, in the Western song, from whom never is heard a discouraging word. And get away from losers. Do you know one of the primary reasons why people lose in life is because they're either brought up by negative people or they associate with losers when they become adults. What we have found is this. You and I have uh, what is called a chameleon response to relationships. We have a tendency to adopt the words, the actions, the behaviors, the uh, mannerisms, the dress, even the slang of the people that we associate with most of the time. If we're not very careful, we'll take on their coloring like a chameleon and we become just like them. I can tell you dozens of stories of men and women who just switched reference groups and their whole life changed. They went from company A to company B and in company A they never accomplished anything and in company B they became superstars. People that went from bad relationships to good relationships, and in a bad relationship, they were never happy or successful. And in a good relationship, they accomplished wonderful things. Get away from negative people. Get around positive people. Associate with winners in your life. Now, the fifth part is positive training and development. Positive training and development is a part of your physical fitness program. We know that learning today is the key to the future. That whatever you know today, it's becoming obsolete at a rapid rate. We also know that there's a direct relationship between competence, how well you do what you do, and self-esteem. Self-esteem, how much you like yourself, how much you respect yourself, how good you feel about yourself, and so on, is the better you get at doing the important things in your life, the happier you are about yourself. The happier you are about yourself, the more positive you are. The more positive you are, the more people like you. The more people like you, the more they want to work with you and help you and assist you. What we have found, is that in life, most of your success is going to come from other people. Most of your success is going to be, come from someone who helps you. And people like to help other people who are good at what they do and who are pleasant and easy to get along with. So, here are the keys to positive training and development. Read on a regular basis. Read an hour a day. 30 to 60 minutes every day will make you one of the great authorities in your field in a couple of years. Listen to educational and uplifting audio cassettes in your car. Turn driving time into learning time. The average person spends 500 to 1,000 hours a year in their car. And if you turn that driving time into learning time, you will become one of the most successful and best paid people in your society. And third, take every course that you possibly can. The future depends upon formal education, professional training courses, public seminars. Remember this, continuous learning is the key to the future. In fact, the only real skill that will count in the future when all knowledge and skills are becoming obsolete is the ability to learn new things at a rapid rate. So dedicate yourself to lifelong, continuous personal improvement. By doing that, the things that you will accomplish will be amazing. Now, the second quality of self-made millionaires 
Millionaires always allow themselves to dream. Number two is do what you love to do. There are many people, by the way, many self-made millionaires who will tell you that any one of these is the most important. But all together, <laughs> wow. Do what you love to do. Why do you do what you love to do? We've talked about it before. It's because it's only when you're doing what you love that you'll have the energy and the enthusiasm and the passion to overcome all the obstacles that you'll experience. And you will experience yeah. endless obstacles, endless difficulties, frustrations, crises, setbacks, disasters. I cannot tell you, Henry Ford went broke, bankrupt three times yeah. before he invented the automobile. It's an interesting thing. They did an article in Forbes magazine last year on garages and the garages that were the starting points of great fortune. Henry Ford was living in a rented house and he had a rented garage. And he worked in this garage on his car. And he finally got the car put together. He was 42 years old and it worked. But the garage was made of brick and it wouldn't go out of the garage. It was too big. And he went to the owner of the garage and he said, come and see what I've got. Yes. And the owner came and looked at it and he said, how does it work? He said, it's a, like a carriage without horses. He said, geez, he said, that is incredible. And the owner went and got a sledgehammer and broke down the wall of his garage so Henry Ford could drive it out. Can you imagine the vision of a person like that? Back in the uh, 60s, when the first couple of franchises of McDonald's were just getting going, they ran out of, into money problems. Uh, Waycroc bought out the McDonald brothers. He owned it. There were serious financial problems. They were behind. Their bank was going to foreclose on them. They were trying to yeah. stay in business and generate enough cash flow. So Ray Kroc went to some of his suppliers. One of his suppliers was Coca-Cola. He said, look, he said, I've got my back against the wall here. I've got to have longer credit. He said, I can't pay you, but I've got to stay in business. I've got to have Coke. And he said, they said, tell us about your business. He said, this is my concept. A standardized process of high quality, low priced hamburgers, malts, french fries across the country. They said, that is a great idea. He said, Ray, we'll back you as long as it takes. Go for it. And with that backing, he was able to get through his cash flow crunch and build the biggest franchise in the world.